ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Commander Pacific Area Vice Admiral Manson K. Brown. Thank you, Captain Diaz. Good day, Team Coast Guard. I'm honored, uh, and Herminia, my wife, joins me in welcoming you to this uh, 2012 State of the Coast Guard Address here on beautiful Coast Guard Island, which is a main hub of Coast Guard operations throughout the Pacific. I want to thank our Commandant for bringing this year's State of the Coast Guard Address to the Pacific. I also want to thank his front office team and our Coast Guard Island team for their collaboration and hard work in planning and executing today's special events. I express special commendation to our Base Alameda Commanding Officer, Captain Gary Spinnick, his Executive Officer, Commander Dave Savachi, and our Project Officer, Captain Evan Watanabe, for their on-scene leadership and all of the teams that have put this together today. I welcome all those viewing this event, whether live or via the web. We've got a very distinguished crowd assembled here, so I'd like to express honor and greetings to a few special VIPs, and I ask the audience to please hold your applause until I signal the end of the list of our VIPs. Of course, I want to welcome our 24th Commandant and his spouse, Mrs. Linda Papp. We're also joined by our 27th Vice Commandant, Vice Admiral Sally Bryce O'Hara. Also joining us from Washington, D.C. is our 11th Master Chief Petty Officer of the Coast Guard, Mike Levitt, and our 9th Chaplain of the Coast Guard, Captain Gary Whedon. I also acknowledge representing the Honorable Marie Gilmore, Mayor of Alameda, of course, the Coast Guard City, Mr. Hadi Monsef. Special welcome to a former Pacific Area Commander, Vice Admiral Jody Breckenridge, and also joining us is Ms. Nancy Ward, FEMA's Director for Region 9. And of course, our District 11 Commander, Rear Admiral Joseph Pepe Castillo, and his wife, Heather. And our Acting Chief Coast Guard Administrative Law Judge, Judge Parlin McKenna. I also extend honor to retired Coast Guard Rear Admirals John Lockwood, John Tazi, and Ron Silva. And welcome to my newest neighbor, Brigadier General Select Mike Weir, Commander Southern Pacific Division, of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and he's joined by his wife, Deborah. Special acknowledgement also to our two command master chiefs, Lonnie Kale Jones from Pacific Area and Rob Bushy from District 11. I also extend honor and greetings to our platinum volunteers of the Coast Guard Auxiliary, particularly the Commodores here, Commodores Peralta, Commodore, and Ramsey. I also acknowledge our generous supporters from the Coast Guard Foundation, our Navy League, and Sea West Coast Guard Federal Credit Union. And appreciate the presence of several of our maritime captains of industry, as well as prominent representatives from some of the think tanks. And we welcome, of course, America's educators and our students, represented by Major Francisco Flores, who is the superintendent for our partnership school, Oakland Military Institute. I also acknowledge the leaders and representatives from all of the various associations that support our shipmates and their families, such as the Chief Petty Officers Association and the Northern California Retiree Council, and our dedicated unit ombudsman and representatives from the various Bay Area spouses groups. Finally, I want to acknowledge all commanding officers present and all of our shipmates from Team Coast Guard in general. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, Please join me in acknowledging all of our VIPs. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I have the distinct honor and privilege to introduce to you a shipmate and a good friend, our 11th Mass Chief Petty Officer of the Coast Guard, Michael P. Levin. Admiral Brown, thank you for the kind introduction, kind words, and uh, I don't know who to thank, but I'll go ahead and thank you for the great weather today. Good morning, Admiral Papp, Admiral Bryce O'Hara, and there's so many distinguished guests in the audience. 
no passing shipmates. I also like to uh, say either good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to all those who watch and live on the webcast. You know, it's hard to believe that a year has already come and gone since a 2011 State of the Coast Guard address. And last year, the Commandant, his message included using his, for, using his guiding principles, he set four priorities for us. He asked us to sustain mission excellence. He asked us to recapitalize and build capacity. He asked us to enhance response and management. And then he asked us to prepare for the future. And this past year, we have accomplished so much. And that's just a testament to the hardworking men and women in the United States Coast Guard. And for that, I want to thank you all. In a few minutes, the Commandant is going to deliver his 2012 State of the Coast Guard address. And as most of you know, we're going to face some significant challenges. And these challenges are just over the horizon. So today, just like he does during his all hands, the Commandant will deliver a message that is easily understood by all. His message will provide clear direction and guidance. And it will set priorities on how we can confront these challenges together. I can tell you without reservation that the Coast Guard could not have a better person at the helm as we navigate through these times of uncertainty. So now it's a great honor to introduce a man that I highly respect, a man who served on six Coast Guard cutters and commanded four of them. He's our 13th Ancient Gold Mariner, and he's our 24th Commandant, Admiral Bob Papp. Thank you. Good morning, shipmates. Good morning. I love that. You know, if I'm squinting a little bit, it's because the Chamber of Commerce has rolled out just the perfect day here. I thought I was in San Diego. I mean, that's what the weather's like. For all the, those of you watching us on the web, the weather could not be better here in Alameda. I'm really thrilled. You know, I felt it this morning. I get up and I always do a run in the morning. So I decided this morning I'd run from my hotel over here to the base. Actually, for one reason, and it ended up being two reasons. I ran down here because before I do something like this, I want to put things in perspective. And I always find that I can put things in perspective when I come back to the waterfront. So I came down here to the waterfront this morning. Hopefully the watch didn't see me. I came down the pier, and it just reminded me of the past. The smells of bacon and eggs cooking, the coffee brewing, the smell of diesel in the air, and the brackish water under the pier. It reminded me of what we're all about, taking in those lines, going out and doing the missions of the United States in these great Coast Guard cutters, great Coast Guard boats, great Coast Guard aircraft, all of them possible because of the great support we get from all the men and women of the United States Coast Guard. But I noticed something else when I came down here this morning. Everybody take a deep breath. Seriously, take a deep breath. <clears throat> you smell that? You know what that is? It's new Coast Guard cutter smell. <laughs> we don't get that too often. And there's a lot of it here in Alameda. Bertoff, Stratton, and Weishi, we're really lucky to have these three ships, and that's why I'm so thrilled to be here. We need to get this new Coast Guard cutter smell on a lot more other ports in the United States as well, and we're working hard on it. I want to say hello to everybody that's watching us via the webcast here today. You know, we've got about three or 400 people here on the pier, but we've got thousands of people out on the web today. And I want to say a special hello to our future heroes and leaders. First of all, the trainees at our training station, the recruits at our training station in Cape May, New Jersey. And then secondly, our cadets at the U.S. Coast Guard Academy. Now, I know the cadets aren't going to be watching this live. In fact, I'm going to be talking to you at 0700 in the morning at the Academy in Leamy Hall. So I thank you all for volunteering to get up right after breakfast and watch this speech. But I think it's important to have our recruits, our cadets, and our officer candidates hear this because we're going to talk a little bit about today's Coast Guard and the challenges that we face. But more importantly, we're going to talk about the Coast Guard that they are going to inherit. 
So I decided to do something a little different this year. I asked commanding officers, officers in charge, to ensure that our entire service views this address. Throughout our history, whenever service leaders had an important message to communicate, they would send it out with the caveat to read to all hands at muster. Today, we're attempting to revive this tradition by using technology. And I'd like to start off by thanking our Pacific Area Commander, Vice Admiral Manson Brown, for being such a gracious host, and Base Alameda's Commanding Officer, Captain Gary Spinnick, for setting up today's activities. To my knowledge, this is the first time that we've ever taken a State of the Coast Guard address outside of Washington, D.C. Now, it's always good to get outside the beltway of Washington, D.C., but it's particularly great to come out here because we're doing it in a Coast Guard city, Alameda, California. And uh, please pass on to the mayor. I know she couldn't be here today, but we are delighted to be here. And thank you so much for the warm welcome and this great weather. I want to thank our Master Chief Petty Officer of the Coast Guard, Mike Levitt, for the introduction. What a great shipmate. I'm so humbled to have an outstanding leader like him working alongside of me as well as I'm also humbled to have a great leader like Vice Admiral Sally Bryce O'Hara as my Vice Commandant. There are things that she has done, work that she has done. She has propped me up over the last couple of years, and we've been lucky to have her as a leader as well. So you might be wondering why. Why did we decide to change the venue for this year's address? Well, the answer is simple. I wanted to come out to the field where we conduct operations to talk directly to you about our Coast Guard. And while I'm speaking to you from Alameda today, I want you to know that I'm extremely proud of all of you, wherever you're serving. You're performing challenging maritime missions, maritime missions that are vital to American security and prosperity. But there's another reason why I chose to address you from Alameda. It's because from our vantage point here on the edge of the Pacific Rim, we can see the future. To the north of our compass lies the Bering Sea, one of the richest fishing grounds in the world. And further north, the maritime frontier of the Arctic. In the summer, an entire new ocean is emerging. The promise of shorter shipping routes, petroleum discoveries, and tourism are propelling an increase in human activity. To the south, along the Americas, lies the Eastern Tr Pacific Transit Zone, an area that smugglers continue to exploit as they try to carry drugs to our shores and our streets. Looking to the east across the heartland, our inland rivers and the Great Lakes, the arteries of our maritime transportation system, the Gulf of Mexico with its vast resources, and further still, the Atlantic Ocean, which for the past two centuries has dominated the focus of our Coast Guard operations. To the west, though, lies the deep Pacific, a vital source of fish that the world depends on. And beyond that, the Asia Pacific, the world's fastest growing region, home to half the global population, whose emerging markets and global trade, and most of it carried by sea, are creating new jobs and new opportunities. For trade to flow, shipping lanes must remain open, ports must be safe, and cargo must be secure. The President recently stated that America will enhance its presence in the Pacific. Well, our Coast Guard's been out here for over a century and a half. In 1849, the first cutter arrived on the West Coast. In 1867, when Alaska became a territory, it was a revenue cutter that carried the U.S. delegation to Sitka. Our crews sounded and charted the Pacific as we enforced federal law, aided mariners in distress, fought and died in wars, and maintained a continuous sovereign presence on the sea. While conducting these missions, we also developed strong and what are now long-lasting partnerships. As the United States looks to expand its leadership in the Pacific, our combination of maritime, military, law enforcement authorities, and our experience in Pacific operations makes us an even more valuable agency for the nation. The Coast Guard offers the President unique national security options. The renewed strategic focus on the Pacific further validates our decision last year to retain separate Atlantic Area and Pacific Area commands. Our experience has also taught us that what you need to operate on the high seas, whether it's in the Atlantic or the Pacific, are modern, 
capable multi-mission high-endurance cutters and aircraft. We're working hard to get them. Directly behind me, you can see the future. The National Security Cutter Bertoff, the first of our new major cutters. And she has shown us what the future holds. Her speed, endurance, and state-of-the-art detection capabilities stopped drug smugglers in the Eastern Pacific. And her superior sea-keeping abilities allowed her to launch and recover boats in the Bering Sea in conditions that our older cutters just could not. The National Security Cutter, or the NSC, is proving to be a vital instrument for protecting American maritime security and prosperity. Of course, I know that your hard work is taking place not just in the Pacific, but throughout the maritime domain. Coast Guard men and women, whether active duty, reserve, auxiliary, or civilian, are on watch and ever vigilant. America is first and foremost a maritime nation. 95% of our foreign trade arrives or is shipped by sea. The maritime transportation system accounts for nearly $700 billion of the U.S. gross domestic product and 51 million U.S. jobs. Our nation's economy and its security depend upon maritime commerce. And our Coast Guard provides for its safe and secure approaches to our shores. Now, I have long believed that the greatness of a nation can be measured by the resources that it provides for the mariner's safe and secure approach to its shores. By that measure, our nation is the undisputed world leader in that it produced the United States Coast Guard, a unique merger of military, maritime, law enforcement, regulatory, marine safety, and first response capabilities. It's absolutely no coincidence that so many other countries seek to emulate our Coast Guard. The Coast Guard's value to the nation has never been greater. So where are we? What is the state of the Coast Guard today? Well, a year ago, we took a fix and we charted a course. This year's fix finds us on track with a good speed of advance, but we are navigating uncertain and stormy seas. Our nation has made hard decisions to cut the deficit and to put our fiscal house in order. These decisions include reductions in defense spending. They include reductions in our own Department of Homeland Security. And after a decade of significant budgetary growth, they may well very likely include reductions in Coast Guard spending. This challenging environment will require us to identify efficiencies, to eliminate redundancies, and reinvest savings in the highest priority activities. The decommissionings of high endurance cutters and patrol boats and the tightening of staffs in the 2013 budget will reduce personnel strength in the Coast Guard by 1,000 people. But this is necessary in order to make room to bring on our new assets. Now we'll do this, but we'll do it in a deliberate way that ensures we deliver the level of Coast Guard services our nation needs. Tightening and targeting reductions in certain areas while investing in key initiatives to rebuild our service. These decisions will provide the Coast Guard with the capabilities and force structure that it needs for the next 40 years and the tools that you need to perform our mission safely and successfully today. We will not allow our service to become a hollow operational force. We will not allow our mission support capacity to be reduced to the point where we cannot maintain acceptable levels of readiness. What we will do is we'll work with the Department and the Administration and the Congress to determine budget priorities and those activities that we may have to reduce in the short term so that we can do all the nation expects of us in the long term. But what is the proper balance? How do we position ourselves for success? These are decisions that call for leadership, leadership at all levels of our organization. So today, I'm going to speak to you as a sailor. I don't apologize for that, because after all, we're a maritime service. My experiences as a captain, as a navigator, and a cutterman have formed my view of the world. And in my career as a sailor, I've found that no matter how severe the storm, no matter how difficult the problem, you continue to work, struggle, and fight. And you rely upon your shipmates. Because ultimately, the weather will change, and conditions will improve. In sailors, I think this instills a sense of optimism and faith. 
as we face our immediate challenges, I want you to know that there's good reason for optimism and faith. In my experience, there are four consistent lessons for what it takes to navigate those uncertain and stormy seas. Lesson one, you need a well-trained crew that's proficient in their jobs. Lesson two, you need well-crafted standing orders. Lesson three, you need a sound ship that's equipped to take on all hazards and all threats. And lesson four, you need to take care of your crew and their families. So what have we done to prepare our service to navigate those uncertain and stormy seas? Let me go back to lesson one, preparing the crew. You recall last year that I spoke to you about sustaining mission excellence through proficiency. Proficiency goes well beyond training and qualification. It's also experience, seasoning, and a commitment to excellence and the pursuit of the mastery of your craft. Now, over the last year, as I've gone to all hands meetings around the Coast Guard, I've often been asked, define proficiency. What is proficiency? Well, I was at a Coast Guard station recently. And I got the same question. So I asked the crew, who's the best boat coxswain? I should have known better. A half dozen bosun mates put their hand up. <laughs> so I rephrased the question. If the search and rescue alarm sounded and you had to go out in a severe storm, who would you want to be the coxswain of the motor lifeboat? Well, then everybody pointed to the commanding officer, a warrant bosun, a surfman with decades of experience. That's mastery of your craft. You know it when you see it. So whether you're in the operational arts or the mission support world or other disciplines, each of us has a duty to pursue perfection and to achieve excellence. Our new assets will only be as good as the men and women who crew them. Commanding officers and officers in charge are responsible for leading their units and chief petty officers are responsible for leading from the front, regardless of whether it's on the deck plates or the hangar deck. We've renewed our emphasis on traditional concepts of leadership, not just the latest management fads. In particular, we focused on command, command authority, responsibility, and accountability. We're now conducting screening panels for all command positions, whether operational or support. We're also requiring all prospective commanding officers, whether afloat or ashore, to attend pre-command training courses. We've completed and we will continue to implement the results of the Aviation Safety Assessment Action Plan. It emphasizes command and leadership involvement from commanding officers through the air crews, on the flight decks and on the hangar decks. Last year, I expressed my grave concern over mounting accidents and deaths within the Coast Guard. Now I realize that the deaths of Coast Guardsmen and the losses of aircraft, boats, or cutters in extraordinary circumstances may very well be inevitable, but we will never allow them to be considered the cost of doing business. Finally, in order to build maritime experience and credibility, we're sending more and more of our new officers out for assignments afloat for their first assignment. Over the past year, we've reviewed our Deployable Specialized Forces, or DSF concept, from stem to stern. Based on that review, I decided to place the DSF under the Pacific Area and the Atlantic Area Commanders to assign clear authority, responsibility, and accountability for managing our DSF in synchronization with our shore-based and maritime forces. To enhance proficiency, we extended tour lengths and selected DSF billets to six years. We've also standardized their equipment and created a DSF Center of Excellence at the Special, Special Missions Training Center. We've established a Force Readiness Command. It stands as the center of excellence for training and standardization. And finally, to support it all, we've created a Director of Operational Logistics, the DOL. They don't like to be called the DOL. It's the DOL. But they have direct responsibility for delivering mission support through our base commands. And base commands, as of April or by April, will complete the conversion of all the fractured support units that we had into 13 regional base commands. This will make a singular commanding officer at each base responsible and accountable for all mission support activities. Proficiency is step one for weathering heavy seas. To meet the challenges ahead, we need you to be the best. The best aviators, cuttermen, 
and boat crews, the best boarding officers, marine inspectors, and engineers, and more importantly, or just as importantly, we need the best acquisition professionals, financial managers, and lawyers, and the best trainers and educators. Being in the Coast Guard is not a part-time job. It's a full-time commitment. We do dangerous things. That's just the nature of our work. Working on the water or over the water is not a natural environment for human beings. But this is where the Coast Guard operates all the time. The complexity of performing any mission on the water is significantly multiplied, particularly when you're doing it in the dark and in heavy seas. So if we're going to do it, and we are, we're going to do it right. And I'm counting on leaders at every level of the organization to make this happen. Lesson two, standing orders. Last year, I mentioned that because we gained many new responsibilities and resources post-September 11th, 2001, it was difficult for us to do the catching up with the operational tempo of writing all the proper standing orders. Well, we're making it a priority to do so now. Today, I'm releasing Coast Guard Pub 3.0, Coast Guard Operations. It's enduring doctrine, which describes in detail how and why the Coast Guard conducts operations and how our operations provide value to the nation. It's posted on our website. Look it up, please. Over the next month, I'll release additional guidance that describes how our forces and missions are synchronized together, and I'm committed to providing you clear guidance on how I expect you to carry out and perform our missions. Lesson three, once you've prepared the crew and you have good standing orders, then you need the equipment to do the job. I'm pleased to report that we're making progress with rebuilding our fleet of cutters, aircraft, and boats. Oftentimes we think it's going too slow, but when you look at it in your wake and you look at what we've accumulated over the last 10 years or so, it's really significant. We just awarded over the last year construction contracts on the fourth and fifth national security cutters. We've also received funding for NSC-6 long lead time materials. Two things made this possible, the strong support of Congress and the excellent work of our acquisition professional workforce. We're also grateful to Secretary Napolitano and to the President for requesting the full funding in the 2013 budget to complete NSC number six, as well as money to continue the offshore patrol cutter project, or the OPC. We have 18 new fast response patrol boats on contract, and we'll commission the first one in April. Response boat medium. We've delivered 82 of those boats to date, and we'll receive 30 more this year. And we've accepted 13 Ocean Sentry Maritime Patrol aircraft, and numbers 14 and 15 are under contract. We have now six missionized C-130J Maritime Patrol aircraft. Airframes number seven or eight are under contract, and thanks to Congress's support, we'll begin building the ninth this year. We're upgrading all our helicopters with state-of-the-art avionics to extend their service life, to increase the safety of our crews, and more importantly, to save lives. We've deployed rescue, the Rescue 21 distress system throughout most of the continental United States, including the Great Lakes. By the end of this year, we'll extend it and make it operational in Hawaii, Puerto Rico, and Guam. So on to lesson four. To weather any storm, you have to take care of your people, your crew, and their families. I want to stop right here, and I want to thank my wife, Linda. She has been spearheading this effort, talking to seamen, firemen, spouses, officers, visiting housing areas, talking to everybody she can, up to including the First Lady of the United States to make sure that we are doing all we can to take care of our families, and I am indebted to her. Thank you. And the even better news is we're making progress. What we've done is we've focused on a number of things, including, first of all, our transfer policies. What we've done is we've looked to create greater geographic and family stability for our people. And as a result, we've reduced costs to our service and to our families, and we also contributed to better continuity and experience at our units. Housing. 
Not only have we received money to build new housing, but we've also conducted a comprehensive study of our housing needs and our inventory. And we've centralized accountability for our more than 4,000 housing units right here at Civil Engineering Unit Oakland. This focused responsibility has given improved oversight and accelerated improvement projects. Another thing important to our families, child care. We've expanded eligibility for our child care subsidy program. While the program's focus will remain to provide support to our families with the lowest incomes, eligibility has also been expanded to even more families. We've hired seven training and curriculum specialists for our child development centers. This will allow us to continue to provide the best programs possible. And we've hired five regional dependent care specialists. They'll assist us with setting up home care in our military housing areas. We've added a new ombudsman program manager who is now supported by a regional ombudsman coordinator at Atlantic area, and we're going to hire an, a coordinator out here for Pacific area as well. These full-time coordinators will assist our current cadre of volunteer ombudsmen. It's my hope that with their support, we'll continue to expand and we'll have volunteer ombudsmen at every Coast Guard unit. Our chaplain corps, they're conducting marriage retreats, communications workshops, personal growth seminars, and they work to strengthen our families. We've even brought on someone full-time to develop a retiree affairs program. In fact, I met with the Northern Cal California Council, but I want to thank in particular Rear Admiral retired Ron Silva. It was really his initiative to come forward and hit me up for ignoring the retired people. I didn't think I was ignoring them, but uh, he gently and forcefully reminded me that our retirees are important. And by golly, we've got more retirees now than we've got active duty people, about 45,000. And they are part of the family, and we're going to do better by them as well. We will continue to advocate and support our loved ones who sacrifice on the home front so Coast Guard men and women are, remain always ready to perform frontline operations. So these four lessons, a well-trained crew, a well-crafted standing orders, a sound ship, and taking care of your crew and their families are how you prepare to navigate uncertain and stormy seas. So now what about the how? How will we carry out our operations in the face of heavy weather? Well, as we describe in Pub 3, we've organized our operational assets into what we call a maritime trident of shore-based, maritime patrol, and deployable specialized forces. We'll deploy these forces either individually or in combination throughout the maritime domain. Our core operational concept is prevention and response. We seek to prevent dangerous or illicit maritime activities as far from our shores as possible while providing safe navigation for mariners in legitimate commerce. When undesirable or unlawful events do occur, we'll respond to protect the nation, minimize the impact, and to recover. Preventing and responding to threats before they reach our ports is not a new idea. In 1787, the father of our service, Alexander Hamilton, wrote, a few armed vessels judiciously stationed off the entrances of our ports might at small expense be made useful sentinels of the laws. Hamilton's vision remains true today. It's just that today's globalized and interconnected world, the functional entrances of our ports are no longer at the mouths of our harbors, but far offshore. To effectively accomplish Hamilton's objective and our current mandate, we have to be in the overseas ports. We have to be on the high seas. We have to be along our coasts and in our domestic ports. We must be able to capably operate in all areas of the maritime domain. Our layered strategy of providing maritime security is designed to accomplish this objective. So let's begin overseas. Our International Port Security Liaison Officers, or IPSLOs, are working in foreign ports to ensure that the security of cargo and ships are right before they set sail towards our shores. We also continue to lead the delegation, the U.S. delegation, to the International Maritime Organization to set standards for maritime safety, security, and stewardship. This year is the 100th anniversary of the sinking of the Titanic, yet 100 years later, the Costa Concordia and her recent loss reminds us of the importance of having safety at sea standards and that to ensure compliance, you need a robust marine inspection program. So let's take a look at our ports. We'll go from the overseas ports to our ports. 
this is the layer that I believe is our best resource. We've recapitalized almost our entire fleet of small boats. We're in the process of recapitalizing all our coastal patrol boats. And we've repopulated our shore stations that were scaled back due to budget cuts in the 1990s. And we've also added those deployable security teams in most of our ports. But the last place we want to discover a maritime threat is in our port. My most pressing concern is on the high seas. Vast oceans lie between the overseas loading ports and our domestic ports of arrival. It's in the offshore region that I see the greatest risk. Patrolling the high seas requires multi-mission cutters and maritime patrol aircraft capable, capable of sustained offshore operation. These assets are the most expensive to acquire and operate, however. Much of our current fleet of medium and high endurance cutters are beyond 40 years old, costly to repair and in need of replacement. Coast Guardsmen require modern ships capable of independent operations on the high seas to perform missions like drug interdiction. These cutters enable us to stop multi-ton loads of pure cocaine before they reach our shores and to protect our fish stocks and the fishermen in the tumultuous Bering Sea. This is why I'm so pleased that the NSC is already proving to be a more than worthy replacement for our obsolete cutters. This is also why we must sustain the momentum on our NSC and OPC acquisition programs. As I alluded to earlier, we also face another unique demand in the Pacific, the emerging Arctic frontier. This summer, exploratory oil drilling will likely commence in the Chukchi and Bering Seas, or Chukchi and Beaufort Seas. In this part of northern Alaska, we currently have no shore-based infrastructure, such as hangars for our planes, bases for our boats, or barracks for our people. So we're going to send a mobile and versatile infrastructure up to the Arctic, the national security cutter Bertoff. Bertoff has worldwide communications and state-of-the-art command and control systems, actually better than most of our shore stations. She also brings the added advantage of being able to launch and recover helicopters and small boats. Bertoff will be supplemented by a couple of our ice-capable seagoing buoy tenders. We feel prepared to take on the challenges in the Arctic because we have adaptable cutters and aircraft and proficient crews. We'll employ them on a seasonal basis while we continue to define our requirements for permanent Arctic infrastructure. The Coast Guard is unique. We have the experience to participate in and lead, where appropriate, the development of our national Arctic strategy. But the imperative for expanded Coast Guard capabilities in the Arctic is now, not 20 years from now. Recently, the eyes of the nation were focused on the Cutter Healy as she broke through hundreds of miles of Arctic ice to enable a tanker to deliver fuel to Nome, Alaska. Coast Guard Polar Icebreakers are the only ships in our national inventory capable of, of performing this mission. And right now, Healy is our only operational icebreaker. We're working hard to return Polar Star to operations in 2013. And when she returns, we will regain one of the most powerful conventional icebreakers in the world, and we hope another 10 years of service from her. But I want to be clear, this is a bridging strategy. As I mentioned earlier, this is an example of scaling back where we must in the short term so that we can do all the nation requires of us in the long term. We need to come to a whole of government determination on the capabilities and resourcing our nation must provide to protect our Arctic interests. Early in my career, there was a time when the Coast Guard operated eight polar icebreakers. How did that happen? Well, I asked the historian, and we looked it up. As it turns out, in 1941, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt passed a handwritten note to Treasury Secretary Henry Morgenthau. On the note, it said, or he handed the note to the Commandant, Admiral Russell Weishi. On the note, it said, Henry, I want the world's best icebreakers. Signed, FDR. I guess the acquisition rules were a little easier in those days. <laughs> well, times are different now. But FDR's order is the kind of action a visionary leader takes to prepare the nation to navigate stormy seas. In even more difficult circumstances, in the midst of the Great Depression of the 1930s, the President and the Congress chose to invest in America's Coast Guard. They built a class of seven new major Coast Guard cutters, 
the 327-foot Treasury class. Why? Because leaders foresaw that America in the future required capable multi-mission ships to meet its challenges. The challenges that were known, but more importantly, the challenges that weren't known, but, could, but uh, were waiting to come upon us. They were preparing for an uncertain future. These seven major cutters carried out missions never imagined in the original concept of operations. Most of these cutters served for more than 40 years. In fact, one of them was decommissioned at 50 years of age. They were able to do this because national leaders with a vision foresaw that capable ships with speed, endurance, versatility were a sound investment against what proved to be a menacing half century to come. Secretary Napolitano understands this. That's why she continues to support our ongoing efforts to recapitalize and specifically to build NSC number six. The story of our 378 foot high endurance cutters is strikingly similar. They're also a class of ships that though they are failing survive today and they've served more than 40 years in combat off Vietnam, in coalition operations off Iraq, protecting our fisheries, interdicting drugs, working to prevent mass migrations from Haiti and Cuba, and saving countless lives. The 378s have served well beyond their time. We know from experience that building multi-mission cutters and aircraft is a proven way to prepare for uncertain times. It helps us to keep the nation safe, our service ready, and it also helps our domestic industries, which create American jobs, skilled and strong. Most importantly, we know that the ships, aircraft, and boats that we buy today will just not shape, but in large part, will define the Coast Guard's next 50 years of capabilities. That will be the primary, they will be the primary tools we rely upon to get the job done, responding to all threats and all hazards throughout America's maritime domain. So what are these uncertain and stormy seas? While well, dynamic and evolving threats are increasing in the global maritime domain, illicit drugs, human trafficking, piracy, terrorism, weapons of mass destruction, illegal fishing, environmental crimes, and belligerent nation states. These stormy seas are also budget driven. The current national deficit demands change. On our current track line, we will likely see the Coast Guard get smaller. We may also encounter those who seek to sacrifice long-term investments, like recapitalizing our cutters, aircraft, and boats for short-term budget gains. But we've been faced with tough times like this before. And as any ship captain can tell you, the most important element to weathering a storm is a great crew. And we are truly blessed to have one in you. We all come from a long blue line of Coast Guardsmen who have confronted heavy seas and prevailed in the face of seemingly insurmountable challenges. Sixty years ago this month, Boson's mate First Class Bernie Weber was the coxswain of a 36-foot motor lifeboat. His crew headed out into 60-foot seas, 70-knot winds, and near blizzard conditions off Cape Cod to rescue 32 men, one by one, from the tanker Pendleton, which had been broken in two by the storm. I'm honored that the first of our new Sentinel class response patrol boats will be named after this heroic bosun's mate. Richard Etheridge, he was the first African American to command a life saving station, Station P Island. This was also the first life saving station crewed entirely by African Americans. Keeper Etheridge never backed down in the face of adversity. Soon after taking command, his life saving station was burned to the ground. He didn't hesitate. He rebuilt it. He also understood the importance of proficiency. He developed rigorous life-saving drills. He constantly tested his crew until he was satisfied he could take on any mission. The Pea Island surfman would go on to rescue hundreds of souls from stranded ships in the most extreme conditions. Etheridge's station became known as the best on the Carolina coast, and he became a legend. It's a point of personal pride that our second response cutter will be named Richard Etheridge, who's not only a Coast Guard icon, but for me, a model for the importance of proficiency. And seaman apprentice William Flores, who died while saving the lives of his shipmates when the cutter Blackthorn collided with the tanker Capricorn. Billy, as his shipmates called him, 
was just 19 years old. He was less than a year out of boot camp, one of the least experienced crewmen on board. But when the Blackthorn capsized, he took off his belt. He used it to strap open the door on the life jacket locker so the life jackets could flow to the surface to help his shipmates. And then he stayed at his station to assist other crew members. In doing so, he displayed amazing courage. He also gave his own life to save others. I'm deeply humbled by his service and his sacrifice. And our third response cutter will bear the name William Flores as a constant reminder of the heroic deeds even the youngest of our Coast Guardsmen are capable of. What a service we have. To name an entire class of ships after our enlisted heroes, it's extraordinary. But this is our heritage. And it continues today with people like aviation survival technician third class Thomas MacArthur, who in an incredible display of bravery made 12, 12 consecutive rescues of individuals who had been overcome by a strong rip current in Lake Michigan. For his actions, he was recently awarded the Silver Life Saving Medal. And Petty Officer MacArthur is with us today. Would you stand to be recognized by your shipmates? <laughs> and cuttermen, like those on the cutter, on the cutter Healy, Represented here today by Healy's captain, Beverly Havlick, the command senior chief, senior chief Apolito, and BM3 Diana Melian. Last month, this crew accomplished something that has never been done before. They broke through hundreds of miles of ice to deliver fuel to the residents of Nome. It was a shared moment of pride for our entire service. Your efforts and those of the long blue line of Coast Guardsmen who have gone before us stand as a testament to human courage, seamanship, airmanship, and skill. You showed the nation once again what a small crew of dedicated Coast Guardsmen can do and how our service remains true to our motto, Semper Paratus, always ready to assist those in distress. So, Captain Havlick, Boats, Senior Chief, could you stand and be recognized by your shipmates here today? I feel so proud to be your commandant. I'm humbled to be your commandant. You know, I've faced a lot of scary things in my life, whether it's hurricanes at sea, ships sinking, rescues, migrants. But the only thing I fear right now is I fear letting you down. We've got some challenging times ahead of us, and what I need is your strength. I need your prayers. I need your support. I need you to be the best you can be so we continue to demonstrate the value that this service gives to our country and we'll get through all this. You protect people on the sea. You protect our country against threats delivered by the sea. And you even protect the sea itself. It's the strength of you, our crew, that allows us to keep doing it. And we can continue to do that if we provide you with cutters, boats, and aircraft that you need to perform our missions. If we do that, we'll ensure that America's Coast Guard remains semper paratus well into the third century of service to our nation. Now, generally, I'm an optimist. But during the few times that I start to get discouraged, it's only because I see too many people in our country who view these uncertain and stormy seas as reasons for doom and dismay. They claim our, our country is in decline and that perhaps the best years of our country are behind us. Well, one thing I'm sure of, those people have never met my crew. Because as we prepare for and proceed into heavy seas, it's your commitment, your spirit, your professionalism that will continue to fuel my optimism. Eventually, the weather will improve. The key to navigating through safely through uncertain and stormy seas is the same that it's been for centuries. It's having a crew of dedicated and disciplined men and women and fortunately, we have you in abundance in our United States Coast Guard. So when the storm clouds drive others for safe harbors, we head out. To those who doubt our ability to navigate through the years ahead, I've got a message for you. We do not fear 
uncertain and stormy seas. That's when you need us the most, and that's when we're at our best. We're Coast Guardsmen. This is our chosen profession. This is our way. This is what we do. Semper Paratus, thank you.